The scripture lesson is Acts 1, verses 6 through 14. Let us begin. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Who's here? Hey, good morning. Hey, Jeremiah. By the way, I'm really, really good at that game. Pac he has got a Pac-Man shirt. That's mine. And Tetris. But thank you. That's wonderful. Hi, Teresa and Jack and Scarlet and Violet and Issa and what's your name again? Owen. Owen. Yeah, I knew that. How are you? Um, We've got a lot going on today, so I just wanted to talk briefly about that story that we just heard. Jesus, today is Ascension Sunday. So we know that, I'm going to see how well you've been paying attention. We know that Jesus died on a, on a cross. Good job. And then he rose again on, on Easter, right? And today, you said on a cloud. So he doesn't, he doesn't die again. He ascends, goes up into a and a cloud, um, in, and that and goes up to the heavens to be with God. And that's Ascension, Ascension Sunday. Um, and it was like in the, um, in the Old Testament, there was a prophet who went up into the same way. And the disciples, his disciples looked up because they were promised a, you know, that, that they would get his spirit if they kept looking up. And that's why the disciples keep looking up. But... God's going to do it differently this time, and cue Pentecost next week that, that um, Norm is going to preach about next week. But so that was more for the, for the adults than for you. But okay, so that was Ascension Sunday. Today is a baptism, and you're going to be invited to stay for it, and then you're going to go out to Sunday school afterwards, but you're getting front row seats, okay? Um, there's a lot that goes on with baptism. It's one of the gifts of Jesus to us, and it is um, a rem it's a lot of things. But it, it we are proclaiming today what is already true: that we are all loved by God, and we are claimed by God, and so we do something public for all to see. And for our own hearts, so that um, so that we are reminded that we are all God's own. And in, on, when people go out at the end, um, I'm going to invite them that they want to to remind themselves of their own baptism by putting, dipping their hand in the water and making a cross on on the top of their foreheads. For you all, I'm just going to do that. Did I get you? Did I get you? Yeah. Okay. All right. In um, in a Catholic church, sometimes the can I do this? 
Yeah, you're looking smiling. You're smiling at me. Okay. Um, in a Catholic church or in, in different traditions, and I've done this. I've gotten an ever, evergreen branch, and they'll do that, and they'll do, and they'll do this to, at the congregation to remind them of their baptisms. It's a reminder that we are loved by God. Isn't that awesome? All right, so you are invited to, um, to, to stay here for the baptism, but uh, let's say a little prayer first. Gracious God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gift of being reminded that we are loved by you no matter what. And we are grateful for that we, all of us, no matter how old we are, know ourselves as your children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Remy's family forward, and we are going to stand around the baptismal font. Here are these words of our Lord Jesus Christ from the Gospel of Matthew. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's from the Gospel of Matthew. And re reading from Acts, For this promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Obeying the words of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptisms as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Remy Rose Nesmith, child of Jordan and Nicole, to receive the sacrament of baptism. I have some questions for the parents. Uh, do you desire that your child be baptized? If so, please say we do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach and model that faith to your child? If so, please say we do. Through baptism, we enter the covenant God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you within the covenant, I ask you, and I'm, I'm talking to you too, I'm asking you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptized. Uh, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, please say we do. Awa, awa, see. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If, please, if so, please say awa. No, please say we do. We do. Okay. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say we will with God's help. Okay. And to everyone, the Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. We pray that over it, to the Holy, your Holy Spirit might move in the begin. Or, let me say that again. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In it, your son, Jesus, received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin and everlasting life. It is this very water that nourishes our fields, feeds our plants, and makes up our very bodies. In this water, we cool off from the intense summer heat, swim and paddle upon its currents, and stand in amazement at the grandeur of your rivers, lakes, and oceans. We thank you, Creator, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we, sh by it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit.
Pour your spirit out upon this water that those who are here are cleansed from sin, born again, and may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Okay, Remy. Ahorita, el agua. Can we, hey, will you, will you let me hold you? Water, agua, agua. Si. Remy Rose, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. En el Espíritu Santo. El Espíritu Santo. Tu abuela habla español, no? Ay, qué bueno. Okay. Let's pray for Remy. Lord, uphold Remy by your Holy Spirit. Watch over her throughout her life. Lead her in your paths of righteousness and fill her with your grace and love. In times of good as well in times of trouble, let her know of your loving presence in her life, both now and forever. Amen. Yeah, agua. We celebrate today what has always been true. God claims Remy as God's own. You get the joy and challenge of raising her to know her creator, her redeemer, and her sustainer. God is praying to her for you. And not to worry, God will send helpers. Let us welcome the newly baptized. Uh, your Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. Here Jesus prays for the disciples. And as a reminder, this is on Monday, Thursday, when, he's, when this is spoken. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to, to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but be on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So whose opinion matters to you? Not everybody's, right? There's some people you could care less what they think, and there's other people that you would be devastated if they thought poorly of you. When we're making a list of, of, when we're trying to make a decision and you're making a list of pros and cons, uh, you might not, not everything has the same weight, correct? I drove to Long Island yesterday for my nephew's engagement party. And, the, you know, the, making the decision to go on the con side was it's in the rain and there's traffic and it's going to take longer than usual. But on the pro side was, I need to show up and be there for my nephew and show him support. So they don't have the same weight. One is heavier than the other. And I often think a person's opinion, the most important opinion, is, is our own. Uh, we need to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror without guilt uh, about the decisions that we make. I, as a young person, I don't know how old, I remember thinking, I hate feeling guilty. <laughs> So I want to live my life in such a way that I don't ever have, you know, so that I could look at myself in the mirror and know that I, even if I make mistakes, I tried my best. How do we decide what is right and wrong? As people of, as people of God, we decide what is right or wrong in conversation with the living God. 
whose opinion has a lot of weight. The word glory or glorify in the Greek corresponds to an Old Testament word, Hebrew, that means to be heavy. Both terms convey God's infinite and intrinsic worth. To ascribe weight recognizes real substance and value. Glorifying God means valuing God and who God is. And we live our lives valuing the opinion of the living God above all others. Another way of saying it to glorify God is to make God's presence known to make visible the presence of God. So when we live and make decisions, giving God's opinion the greatest weight or the greatest sway, the deciding factor, we are glorifying God. The church's mission statement, when we are living into your mission statement, which is connecting with people through Christ to meet the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of the community and the world around us. When you do that, when we do that, we are glorifying God. We could just worry about ourselves. But when we live in community and in service, we glorify God. You make the presence of God known. I listen to uh, different podcasts about, about the scripture passages for the week. And one of the, one of them I was listening to like, said that if the passage that we just read in John were handed into a seventh grade teacher, they would send it back and say, stop using the word glorify, find another word. And I feel like I just did that. It's in trying to unpack that, just too many words. But we are told living, believing in in God and in the weight and in caring about the opinion of God in our lives, that that is eternal life. I don't know if you heard it in this passage. John 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, according to the gospel writer John. Eternal life or abundant life is to live in the knowledge of God. To know God is to glorify God, to make God known in word and deed. One more time, eternal life is to know God and to live out of that truth and that relationship. Amen. And we see in this passage, in that relationship, God prays for us. In another passage, we read with with sighs too deep for words. Can you imagine being one of the disciples while Jesus prays out loud for them, for you. What we're reading is part of the farewell discourse. In the Gospel of John, Jesus uh, does not go out into the Garden of Gethsemane and pray by himself and the disciples fall asleep. In the Gospel of John, he's in this room with the disciples and they hear him pray. He's praying for them. And I, ask, and I would ask, if Jesus were praying for you, what would he pray? I invite you to meditate on that this week, to take that question with you into the week. Lord, how are you praying for me? For some, God is praying that you would be more gentle with yourselves and let yourselves be loved, flaws and all. For others, God is praying that you will learn to say no or to ask for help, or that you will remember that to to look for all the blessings in life and not focus so much on what's wrong. So again, I invite you to contemplate that question, this God who loves you, who has claimed you and had called you. How is God praying for you? I want to address the stumbling block that's in this passage. There's a It looks like Jesus may be saying that God only cares about some people. Jesus says, I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. So it looks like Jesus is limiting. But let me share with you what Lindsay Jodry writes on this. The world has a prominent and complex place in John's gospel. It is the creation of of God, We read that in John 1, John 7, John 11, John 12. 
the object of God's love and work, John 3.16. It is often char- characterized as hostile to God's work or the realm that God that does not know God, again, John 1. Jesus prays for the world, John 17, and sends the disciples into the world so that the world will no longer be separate from God, again, John 17. Jesus was sent to enlighten the world, John 1, to give life to the world, John 3, John 6, to save the world, John 4, John 12, and to invite the world to join in the love he shares with God, John 14, John 17. So we can see that world does not mean one thing in John's gospel. Rather, the range of meaning reveals a dynamic movement within the story. The world that was positive in relationship to God as God's creation becomes hostile, opposed to God when it rejects Jesus. But as the gospel shows, God works to break down the divide between God and the world as people who encounter Jesus are invited to believe. As he has sent me into the world, Jesus says, so I have sent them into the world. So Jesus is not saying that he cares uh, about these folks or only about these folks. He's praying for the disciples who will be sent out into the world that all might come to know Jesus and experience eternal life. To glorify God is to know the truth of God and to live out of that truth and in that truth and in conversation with God. So that's it. No big deal. Ha. Remy's mom and dad, Nicole and Jordan, you have your homework to live in such a way that Remy knows that your choices are weighed by your relationship by, with God, that God's opinion is paramount in your lives, not that you're going to get it all right, but that you are seeking to live in faithfulness and relationship with God, a God who loves you and who prays for you. Again, that's it. No big deal. Ha. It's not just your homework. It's all of our homework. And our children will see us, and you know this. Our children will see us try and make mistakes, try again. They will call us out on our hypocrisy, where we're blind or prejudiced, how we have struggled to put God first in our lives. But hopefully, she will see, they will see, that this relationship with God is truly what gives us life. In this relationship, we know hope, joy, peace, and love. Our walk is our witness. Our children watch, everybody sees. Our, this relationship with God is our salvation. We are sent out into the world to proclaim with our lives that we couldn't do it without God. That's it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.